Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mears PLC investor presentation relating to the interim results for the period ending 30th of June 2020. Throughout this presentation, investors will be on listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and could be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. I'd like to also remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand over to Lucas Critchley, Chief Transformation Officer at Mears Group PLC. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much for giving up some time this morning. Um, I'll, I'll get started. I'll jump straight in and I'll, uh, I'll move on to slide two. So I'm Lucas Critchley. I'm Chief Transformation Officer at Mears Group. The slide deck that I'm going to run through this morning uh, was presented by David and Andrew to analysts on Tuesday morning, shortly after the RNS um, release. Uh, and then that deck subsequently been delivered to shareholders through a, a, um, a roadshow across the course of this week, which, which is fairly typical for us through uh, interims, finals, and, and, and equally any sort of capital markets day, days we do through the, the course of the year as well. So the agenda I'm going to run through today, again, a very fairly, uh, very standard agenda for us at, at both interims and finals. Um, typically, David will, would normally run through the operational review before handing across to Andrew to do the finance review, uh, with David then covering off the strategic section and the outlook. The outlook itself will look slightly different this year with no guidance being given at this time off the back of um, the period we've the COVID period we've just been through. Um, but I'll come on to that later on and give a bit more bit more um, depth around that uh, when we get there. Um, so as much as I plan to go through this interim slide deck this morning, what I'd also try to do is give some additional information uh, about the makeup of the group and the services we provide and also a bit of um, context of where each um, part of the group is at within its sort of evolution as well. I'm very conscious that this is a this is a different audience which will have varying degrees of understanding of, of the Mears Group business. So what I'll try and do is get that balance right between delivering the, the interim presentation, uh, but also giving some of that background and context about who we are and what we do as well. A quick bit of background on myself. I've been with Mears for 16 years. I was previously the managing director of the south part of our maintenance business. Um, prior to moving into this group role that I'm in now uh, about three years ago. Um, I work closely with the Chief Executive David, uh, particularly around business change. Um, so that includes new contract mobilizations, um, transitioning acquired businesses, uh, and also contract turnaround where that's required as well. However, I'm still heavily involved in the um, uh, in the day-to-day -day operational running of the business as well, which is fairly typical of the senior team and I think a, a strength of the senior team in, in, in Mears. Um, so in terms of today's session, I'll run through what David would have done, so the operational and strategic sections, and I'll also pick out some highlights from the finance section of the presentation as well. Presentation will hopefully last about 40 minutes, uh, leaving us with about 20 minutes for question and answer at the end. As Mark said, you can submit questions through the portal um, and I'll pick those up at the end. Um, anything I don't get to today, I'll ensure that we come back to uh, come back to you by close of play on Monday at the latest. So the operational review of the of the period of uh, the first half of the year. Um, just before I jump into this, I want to give some very brief context about the size and shape of the group. Um, so we are a housing specialist and there's a few bits of the group I'm going to talk about today, which is just um, worth me giving some very brief background on. We're a housing specialist that, that delivers services in two key areas with two key client groups. So we provide maintenance and we provide management of housing. So the maintenance business, largely with local government clients, uh, is where we respond to calls from social housing, housing tenants to deliver responsive repairs and maintenance, and that's tap washers and toilet seats, all the way up to sort of kitchen and bathroom refurbishments in their homes on behalf of the social landlords. The other part of the group is the uh, management part, um, and that's where we manage property largely on behalf of central government clients, 
um, and that's for a range of um, of, uh, of end users. So um, homelessness is a big part of the ma management um, um, business unit um, and asylum accommodation also. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll develop a bit more of those two parts of the group as we go through. The other bits to listen out for, and I'll, I'll try and be very conscious of trying to explain as I'm going through um, any parts of the group that I'm talking about. Um, we've also got the domiciliary care part of the business, which is not part of the long term plan. We've exited the um, Scottish, uh, the England and Wales part of the domiciliary care business, and, and we're optimistic that the Scottish part will follow later in the year. I'll touch on why we've exited that part of the business through the presentation. Um, the other non core part of the business is funded development. Again, we're very clear on where we're heading with that, and we're in the process of exiting funded development. Um, and there's one other sort of non core part of the business I'll touch on later as well. But very much in terms of going forward, heading into 2021, a housing specialist providing maintenance and management services to local and central government clients. Uh, one of the real strengths of the group is the longevity of relationships and um, typically 5% operating margins, but over long, long contracts, you know, 10 years up to as much as 30 years in some in some cases. And that's a, a very brief canter through what the what the shape of the group looks like. So we've had to take a slightly different approach to these uh, first two slides uh, this time. Typically, this would be a single slide with some highlights of, of, of H1. It's split into two this this time, and it um, that I think that reflects the uh, the sort of uh, the nature of the of the six months we've just been through, really. Um, so we split it into uh, into some strategic highlights and some some financial highlights. So in terms of operations, 2019 started really well. Through January and February, we were, were making really good progress against our strategic commitments. And those strategic commitments include things like exiting domiciliary care and winding funded development um, and some of the other bullets that I'll come onto on the slide there as well. Um, we're making good, really good progress there whilst also hitting our numbers as well, which is obviously hugely important. Um, and if anything, January, Feb and into early March, we're probably slightly ahead on both of those two metrics. So, uh, so a positive start to the year. And then, and then of course, um, COVID arrived. I'd like to think we responded very quickly. Um, we had a meeting of all the senior team uh, mid-March where we were I think we were fairly clear by that point that, that was the last time we were all going to be sat in a room together for a while and we responded quickly diligently and and as is the mere's way with a very strong operational and customer customer focus to um, to manage those challenges and i think we've done a good job of that um and i think the h1 numbers that you see um when set against that hugely challenging backdrop i think are sound I mentioned on the first bullet there the AASC contract, the asylum accommodation contract with the Home Office, central government client. Um, that's become fully embedded, mobilised in September last year. And early this year, it was delivering operationally very well, commercially exactly where we anticipated it would be, which is a, yeah, a, um, a success that shouldn't be underestimated. The challenge there in recent months has been, um, uh, been operational challenges through COVID and the restrictions and trying to manage that part of the business through those restrictions and also in some increasing volumes that we're seeing in that area as well, which I'll come on to. MPS, the um, maintenance business that we acquired in November 18, fully integrated, fully embedded and on track. So a, so a big tick there. I've already mentioned the exit from our um, England and Wales domiciliary care business. Uh, that's happened. That's been completed. And we anticipate uh, or we're optimistic that the um, Scottish part of that business will will exit um, in, in H2. And the unwinding of our funded development um, business has progressed really well as well. Um, COVID has delayed that undoubtedly. And, and what was hopefully going to be a, something that would be concluded by the end of 20 is, is more likely to be a, um, a 2021 conclusion now. A really important point to note, um, procurement and bidding activity has reduced uh, through the COVID period, as you would probably expect. But our maintenance contract win has been really positive. So the, the largest part of our group, the, the longest running part of our group has, has seen a, uh, an 80 percent win rate, which is unprecedented, really. It's, um, that's a huge success through such a such a difficult time. And in terms of COVID, I think we've coped. We've coped very well in difficult circumstances. We've maintained um, services. Um, we've been hugely diligent and, and with a with a real operational focus. As I said, and operational performance as a result has been excellent. Um, and importantly, we've remained in a very strong, comfortable place in terms of liquidity as well, which I don't think should be should be sort of overlooked or taken for granted. Some of the financial highlights from from H one. 
COVID clearly had a, a huge impact, a material impact on our on our H1 numbers and, and the numbers that I'll, I'll be talking to you about today and that you, you may have seen ahead of today's session um, are unrecognisable from any previous MIRS period and, and hopefully from any uh, future MIRS period as well. But that's not to say that they haven't been extreme, those numbers haven't been extremely resilient. Um, and I'll talk you through the makeup of some of those numbers today as well. If I was to describe the impact on the two core parts of our business, you'll be you'll see that they've been affected in very different ways. So firstly, the maintenance business um, has been hugely affected. Um, at its peak, we lost about 85% of um, volume in the maintenance business or, or, or that sort of proportion of the, the volume in that part of the business stopped. Um, and really all we were delivering through that period were emergency works only. Of course, all of this is work in people's homes. So as, as lockdown arrived, it became emergency ser services only. Um, and that was a it was a letter from government at that time, central government at that time, to every single social tenant explaining that the, the, the repair service they should expect through the coming weeks and months would be emergencies only. And that's things like loss of power, loss of heating and hot water, major leaks, really you know, things which were going to threaten the um, health and safety of our customers. And that really resulted in us delivering sort of 15 percent of what we would typically be doing in the maintenance business through that period. We're really fortunate that we've received a great deal of support uh, through that period from from our um, from our customers. And that's why you'll see this discrepancy, this positive discrepancy between work volumes falling off a cliff and revenues not reducing to quite the same extent. Um, also, something that helped at that time was a public procurement note from central government, which was a which guidance to all public bodies and you know, in, in turn all of our clients, really housing associations, local authorities, central government departments to support contractors and service providers through this period. That guidance really helped. And when you add to that the strength of our existing customer relationships, it's allowed us to navigate this um, this period. Um, yeah, as I say, reasonably well. In management, it's been a slightly different challenge. So um, workloads have been largely unaffected, particularly in the uh, asylum accommodation contract um, that I've mentioned, um, uh, where we have seen some slight downturn is in our homelessness accommodation and also our substitute accommodation for, for the MOD contract, the, the uh, outside the wire um, housing for service personnel. But um, I think it's fair to say the greatest challenges in uh, management through this period have been operational rather than commercial. Also worth noting that liquidity has remained really resilient. We did extend facilities early early in lockdown. Um, we felt it was prudent to do, to do so, but with no real expectation that those extent, extended facilities would be required. And that's absolutely proved to be the case and, and remains the case today. So I've mentioned the two um, the two different parts of our business. We're going to get slightly more detail on what H1 has looked like for maintenance and management. Um, the group itself, particularly as we go into 2021, is very has got a very clear service offer to customers, um, got very clear structure internally as well. It is, it is maintenance and it's management. Um, and I think that leaves us with a really neat group. So a very large group, but a very neat group where which sits absolutely within sort of the sweet spot of our core competencies. So in terms of maintenance, a business that we've been in for 25 years plus, um, we've had a huge amount of client support through the COVID period. Um, a small number of clients didn't support us uh, and weren't prepared to go Sort of over and above their contractual obligations to support us through this period, didn't feel that they should follow the uh, the government guidance through that public public procurement note that I mentioned. Um, yeah, and I'll come back to to, to the response to that uh, later on. Again, something I'll touch on shortly uh, in terms of how the maintenance revenues have been affected is is this different approach to our contracts, this sort of scheduler rates um, approach to our maintenance contracts where we effectively get paid for what we do, and this lump sum approach to our maintenance contracts where we get paid to deliver a service irrespective of, of work volumes uh, going up and down within that. So I'll, I'll do a touch on a bit of detail on that later, which I think explains the, um, the H1 outturn uh, that you'll see in those maintenance revenues revenue numbers. We've been through a bit of a journey um, in terms of COVID and our maintenance business, which really started with, with lockdown and with the, um, with the communication from central government that all social tenants could expect was an emergency service. And that's where 
um, volumes reduced to about 15% of anticipated uh, levels. There was then a second letter that said, as, as lockdown eased, that we would now be uh, a they could that social tenants could now expect um, to receive essential repairs as well. And that was actually that sounds quite um, like there's not that much of a difference between emergency and essential, but that did result in a. Uh, in starting this process of volumes of work coming back. So rather than just looking after the health and safety of, of the customers, it was around ensuring the long-term um, fabric of the property was in good order as well. So that, that, that expanded the, our ability to deliver works back into people's homes as well. And, and in terms of that journey, uh, I've mentioned the 15% through the early part of lockdown, that rose to about 43% of top typical work volumes following letter two by sort of half year. And we're in late August now. We're back up to about fifty-seven percent of typical work volumes as we uh, as we head into September. Expect that to to continue that trend to continue across the coming months, as long as there's no second spike or not too many local lockdowns, um, particularly in the areas that we work. Um, um, but we are awaiting a final letter from from central government to go out, which says sort of effectively back to normal. That you can expect the full full range of repairs services, and and as that. Um, arrive shortly thereafter we'd hope to get back to to typical work volumes our people um, we directly employ wherever we can and our people have um, worked tirelessly diligently um, yeah with huge passion I think to to keep themselves safe to keep our customers safe and to deliver good quality services which is through which has been a, a hugely challenging period particularly in those early days of lockdown when everyone was getting their heads around exactly what this meant what this meant so we've um, yeah we've really kept our promises to our customers with through this period which has been which is really important to us um, as much as 30 percent of the workforce um, was furloughed at one point um, this has reduced significantly as the work volumes have come back um, down to less than 200 people still on the furlough scheme at the moment and that will taper off over the coming weeks as the as the work volumes return a lot of procurement and bidding activity has been delayed through this period as you'd expect um, but that's presented some opportunities for us as well opportunities to extend or negotiate existing embedded relationships um, and i'll give some detail on that later but that's 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 been a real positive for us actually and, and again speaks to the the strength of some of our customer relationships um, bidding will start ramping up later this year and certainly into 2021 and for a number of reasons we feel we're we're really really well placed um, uh, as we go into that period to um, yeah to have a good good run on on uh, on new business so that was maintenance management the other part of the group um, client support was probably probably even easier in management um, with largely central government uh, clients as you'd expect um, so m many of those clients have gone sort of above and beyond to work with us through this period and we've actually seen some extra volumes in certain areas um, particularly in the asylum accommodation contract the two areas that we have seen a downturn is um, uh, our homeless accommodation where local authorities have been through the covid period were tasked with managing their um, uh, managing their homeless uh, homeless need um, and in many cases using hotel accommodation to meet that short-term challenge those those volumes will come back as we come out of uh, covid but some yeah some short-term reduction in volumes in our homelessness accommodation uh, part of the management business and the other area is the substitute accommodation contract where there was a period early in lockdown where where the property that we look after that we manage for um, service personnel who live outside of military bases we, we do that nationally for the MOD. Uh, there was a slowdown there with people not moving house and, and, and staying where they were for a period of time. That's coming back now. And again, that's only a short term issue. Those volumes will return. Um, there remains a, a significant future opportunity within the management business. And that really comes from everything we see in the news every day at the moment. So asylum, uh, asylum seeker numbers uh, rising, um, homelessness need increasing. You know, it's a huge issue prior to COVID. It'll be an even greater issue as we come out of COVID. Um, and just housing need pressures generally. Um, it's, an, it's a real national challenge. Um, and I think we're really well placed to, to, um, to benefit from that um, later this year and certainly going into 2021. With that comes a responsibility on ourselves, I think, to, to um, be really selective uh, and ensure that we sort of maintain our position as a partner of choice for both, both local and central government.
for slide nine, this is a really important slide for me with a really important message within it, I think, about the approach of the group generally. Um, we've, we've built the group by investing in, by investing in, in client relationships, long-term commitments with opportunities to develop relationships and, and in turn develop our contracts with clients over a long period of time. Um, we've invested in systems. We have market leading IT systems to deliver the type of work that we deliver. Uh, again, some of those we began developing some 25 years ago and they've improved and improved. And, and those systems put us in a really good place. So when lockdown arrived and overnight it was home working, it was operatives um, going directly from their home to their first job in the morning. It was all business as usual for us, really. The, the, the ability to work remotely, um, strong client IT interfaces as well. Yeah, all, all business as usual, and we've seen very little disruption in our ability to deliver services as a result of all that upfront investment in IT. Um, and that puts us in a really strong position, I think, as I say, when bidding activity starts again, we'll be able to meet the challenges that customers are going to be presenting us with about how they want their services delivered going forward. We've invested in our people. We've always been hugely committed to apprenticeships and, and a large national apprenticeship scheme. We've always been committed to direct employment as well. I mean, there's always been a um, sort of a question asked of us, well, could you not just subcontract all of this work, particularly our maintenance and refurbishment work? Well, just subcontract it. Potentially there's better margins there. Potentially you're placing uh, risk elsewhere. Never been part of our business model. We always directly employ, directly employ out of the communities within which we work. Um, and that serves us really well. The idea of trying to work with, a subcontract model through the COVID period when subcontractors will have been struggling with liquidity issues of their own and still trying to main and us then still in turn trying to main, maintain services would have been a really tough place to be. So I think, um, again, our, our investment in our people has, has, has paid dividends. And finally, liquidity. We have very strong relationships with, with the banks. That's relationships that have been built over a number of years. And, and a credit to, to Andrew, the, the finance director, um, regular correspondence, regular communication. And when it came to that conversation about extending our facilities, that was a, that was a relatively straightforward conversation. We have taken some criticism historically around taking such a long term view, not being, you know, we don't really deal with short term, short termism. And um, I think through this period, it's paid us back in spades. And I think we're so glad that we haven't de deviated from um, from the Mir's way of doing things. So I'll canter through the finance section. I'll pick out some important points as we go. Um, clearly, I'm happy to respond to any detailed questions you've got on numbers. And, and Andrew, likewise, will be well, will be happy to do so. Um, we'll look to respond to any questions uh, that we don't, that I don't answer today in writing, but I can sort of close the play Monday. Um, so I think the income statement itself represents a, a challenging period. Um, it's worth noting that uh, domiciliary care is treated as a discontinued activity in, in our numbers. Um, and just one other point to make there really is uh, all of all the downsides incurred within the period have been, have been dealt with in normal trading. Um, that's always been the Mir's approach and that approach has continued even through those through these um, most challenging of times. So the segmental reporting, a um, couple of things to, to, to note, our funded development arm has been unwinding. Um, and that's the re again reflected in these numbers uh, that's been delayed by COVID. And it's also worth noting for any of you who have seen Mia's numbers previously, our housing with care number is now included within, within the management line. Um, development, we're very clear on where we're going with that at some point across the next 12 to 18 months. Um, that will no longer be there. So we will be reporting a management line and a maintenance line going forward. Internally, we talk very much in terms of local government, central government. Um, but yeah, that's how you can expect to see our numbers presented going forward. So what stands out here really is the uh, the differing impacts on revenue and in turn profit across the two uh, core areas, maintenance and management. And that, I think that clearly reflects the, the differing COVID journeys that those two business units have been through that I described earlier. Uh, what we include on this slide also is a breakdown of H1 revenue split into Q1 and Q2. And again, that shows the, clearly shows the impact of COVID um, as lockdown hit in late March. Development itself has been mothballed through COVID. We've effectively closed sites, stopped, um, uh, stopped work on the development of, of new homes. 
very small numbers as we unwind this development business. We are talking small numbers of properties still to be completed, very few, and a, and a, a relatively small number of properties still to be sold as well. But yeah, through COVID, that is going to add some delays to that unwinding. Um, it's just worth noting that the loss there against development in H1 reflects some restructuring costs, but also some revaluation of the portfolio. Um, very hopeful that H2 will see a break-even position in development, but um, I think more importantly, we're, we're very clear on where we're going. That that won't form a, a part of the a part of the group in the in the medium and long term. So the intention here on this slide is just to give a bit more detail about the impact that COVID has had on those maintenance revenues. As I say, the management revenues have been largely unaffected. Um, so that yeah, it, I thought it was worth spending a bit of time just just looking at those maintenance revenues and how they've been affected. Um, so as we reverted to emergency repairs, um, what we've seen there is a reduction to about fifteen percent of our typical uh, anticipated volumes. Um, and as I mentioned previously, what you see there is that disconnect, and again, a positive disconnect between volumes uh, and then re the resulting revenues. There's a few reasons for this. So 20% of our contracts within the maintenance portfolio operate on this lump sum basis, and effectively, we get paid to deliver a service irrespective of volumes of work received. Now, as you can imagine, through normal trading, those fluctuations in work volumes are very, are very minimal. They've been huge through the COVID period. So our revenue on those 20% of contracts within the portfolio has been maintained um, you could almost argue we've been better off as a result of having no work coming through the door on those contracts however what we've had to do is clearly is make some very prudent cost accruals um, to ensure that we're ready to deliver that work as it comes back on um, through the coming months um, the other 80 percent of the maintenance portfolio is is scheduler rates linked we effectively get paid for what we do um, and uh, in these areas we're very reliant on um, on the strength of our client relationships and gaining the, our client support to, to help us through this period in the vast majority of cases we've received direct cost recovery um, and also recovery of local overheads what we haven't had is um, is the luxury of recovering profit I suppose quite absolutely quite rightly through that period and not all of our central overhead has, has been recovered as well through those interim uh, negotiated arrangements if you like and, and all of that goes into um, the numbers that you see for H1. There have been some areas where we've not received client support and we've had to take some very difficult decisions uh, to exit some of those contracts. In turn there's also been some additional costs relating to furlough top-up um, and some restructuring costs as well. And again, as I mentioned earlier, all expensed in the period that they were incurred, as is as is the Mears way. So the expectation from central government throughout the COVID period has been that um, clients would pay early where possible and certainly on time to support contractors and service providers through the, through the period. And I have to say that um, clients have been generally excellent uh, in doing exactly that and, and supporting us and and that's really helped with our management of working capital through this period uh, in some areas where we've negotiated those negotiated those interim arrangements it's actually resulted in us going from uh, raising uh, multiple you know sometimes thousands of invoices in a month to be paid on those sort of transactional maintenance contracts and that being replaced with a single monthly invoice for for these interim arrangements so it's actually been been beneficial in that respect in terms of getting paid on some uh, on some occasions early but certainly on time so i think we and i think we've got a very positive working capital position uh, in h1 considering the huge challenges that we've been presented with and we're really hopeful but that come the end of this year we can we can sort of achieve a, a, a sort of a break-even position uh, in terms of the bottom line um with but also a, a working capital position, which broadly reflects where we started the year as well. And I think with the challenges that that 2020 has brought, that would be a that would be a fantastic achievement and put us in stand us in really good stead going into 2021. So clearly, liquidity could have been a significant issue through H1, um, but I think due to sort of diligent uh, operational and financial management, we've been in a relatively comfortable position, which. Don't think it should be taken for granted or overlooked. There's some huge challenges out there for a number of businesses, for most businesses, um, through this period. And um, yeah, we're, we're, we're fortunate that um, as a result of everything I've, I've sort of talked through in the first part of this presentation, that um, we've managed to deal with that liquidity challenge um, relatively comfortably. 
and just worth mentioning again, as I said, we did um, prudently increase our revolving credit facility early in lockdown. There was never any intention of needing to use that, uh, and that absolutely remains the case. There's nothing of huge note to mention on the balance sheet, though one number I will just draw your attention to is the right of use asset number, which is a fairly notable one for the business, um, or has become so in the last three or four years and will be important going forward as well, uh, particularly on the asylum accommodation contract where we're transitioning the housing portfolio away from purely a private rented sector model to property that we have greater control over in terms of the quality of those those properties and the, and the management of those properties. And that does have a balance sheet, uh, an impact on, on that right of use asset number in the, in the balance sheet. Um, and, and that's a big part of our offer to the home office in terms of the asylum accommodation contract so you should expect to see that number increase across h2 and into 2021 the period itself shows very little movement in that number which is understandable as there's been sort of a general slowdown in our our transition from the prs approach to our to our preferred approach and the home office's pr preferred approach um and, and not only that but the number of leases starting and ending have sort of netted each other off in that period but um yeah and a number to note um, going forward if if you're going to follow the mere numbers so finally i'm going to run through a bit of a strategic update um so we've been through this period of sort of strategic repositioning we went through a strategic review 12 18 months ago and made some fairly major decisions about how we wanted the group to look um, going forward and, and this uh, and that's become very very clear in uh, in, the, in recent months our sort of clear unique offer has really come into quite sharp focus and that is everything I've talked about already as being a, a, a specialist housing provider delivering services in two key, key areas maintenance and management to two key customer bases and that's local government and, and central government um, we made the decision that domiciliary care wasn't going to be for us in the medium and long term. We made a decision that funded development um, for a number of reasons wasn't right for us and wasn't right for our investor base. Um, we're well down the road with, um, with, with moving on both of those two parts of the group uh, and leaving us with this sort of really neat, um, really neat, tidy group with a really clear and compelling service offering uh, to customers. And, uh, and we think an equally compelling uh, offer to, uh, to investors as well. What it also allows us to do is deliver what we're good at, strong long-term relationships with local and central government clients, um, and all of that work that we're delivering in the in the maintenance uh, business and the management business sit absolutely within the sweet spot of our core competencies. All parts of the business uh, will be delivering a appropriate level of return on capital employed as we go into 2021, as funded development disappears, as, um, as we exit domiciliary care. Um, and importantly, both of these key areas of the group have, have huge opportunities for, for growth, revenue growth, and also margin improvement um, as we go into 2021. Another important slide here, um, and this shows the broad changes in our uh, in our core business revenues from 19 to 21 so yeah, clearly 20 is a is going to be a complete anomaly in in anyone's numbers really and what we wanted to do is paint a bit of a picture of where our revenues have uh, will head from 19 uh, across to 21 21 and this is purely in terms of the maintenance and management businesses so ignoring the changes that are inevitably inevitably going to happen in um, in domiciliary care and funded development as well so if we track this graph from left to right, what you'll see um, on the left hand side is where we were in 19, the 866 million of maintenance and management revenues. And as we move across from left to right, you'll see a number of different um, items on the bottom uh, axis there. Some of these were absolutely known and, and well communicated. And some of these, I suppose, we couldn't have envisaged really. So if I start with the first one, which is um, the acquired MPS portfolio. Well, when we acquired that business, we, we knew the portfolio we were inheriting um, wasn't perfect. And as we've gone through that process of transitioning the MPS um, business into the group, um, we've, we've cleansed that portfolio. Um, we've absorbed it into the group. We've got much better operational and commercial controls over those contracts now. However, there was always likely to be 
a proportion of that that wasn't ultimately going to fit and wasn't going to stay within the group. And, and, and that was expected. And that's the 20 million you can see there, of uh, a reduction in revenue. Um, secondly, a number of contracts that we made decisions that, again, weren't for us long, long term. So that's contracts where we made a decision that we weren't going to rebid or equally contracts where clients have decided to make, for whatever reason, make decisions to head in a slightly different direction. I'll touch on one of those, which is a really good example shortly. Now, that block there is not necessarily a negative. It may see re reduction in some reduction in revenue. That doesn't necessarily mean reduction in profit. Doesn't necessarily mean um, ending of customer relationships. And I'll, I'll give an example of that um, in a couple of slides time. The next two that we come to absolutely we didn't envisage and we didn't envisage COVID coming along and the impact that was going to have on us as a group and, and ultimately on our, on our maintenance forward order book as well. So if we jump across to the 30 million, um, I mentioned a couple of times earlier in the presentation where we've had this huge amount of support from some, some really fantastic customers through, to, to help us through this period. Um, and I think that's testament to, to working with people for a long time and delivering for them for a long time and building strong relationships. There were a small number of customers who, for whatever reason, didn't feel that they could support. And actually on those SOR type contracts, those um, get paid for what you do type contracts said, well, I'm sorry if you're delivering less work, but we're going to pay you for, for the work you do. Now, clearly where we've got a branch set up, we've got a directly employed workforce, we've got vans, we've got an office, we've got IT, we've got operatives. Um, yeah, there's a big cost there to potentially only be generating a very small amount of revenue, you know, 20 or 30 emergency repairs a week at a hundred pounds each. Yeah. You can, you can um, see the losses which would be incurred pretty quickly. We're a business that always takes a long-term view, always looks to support our clients wherever we can. And I suppose if that had been a, a two week impact, a four week impact, even we may have, we may have been able to take a different decision. However, yeah, it was became apparent pretty quickly that COVID wasn't going to go, go away quickly. Um, and it would have been, um, it would have been naive of us and, and, and probably not the right thing to do in terms of our uh, our shareholder base to um, continue with contracts where we had no visibility of recovery. Um, so, yeah, we, with a heavy heart, we decided to exit a number of contracts there. And that's the, the 30 million you see. Similarly, uh, but slightly different, uh, the 20 million just to the left there was exiting some contracts that weren't performing. And that's not performing for a number of reasons. Um, we, would, we were having con uh, conversations with these clients for a number of months leading up to COVID arriving. And I suppose COVID was the point at which we had com discussions with those clients about um, are things going to change? Can we do things slightly differently? And when it became apparent that wasn't an option, then yeah, it was the right time to exit those as well. As we jump across one more to the right, you then see the full year benefit of the asylum accommodation contract that was mobilized September last year. Um, it did about 45 million of revenue in the uh, in the 19 number. The full year benefit sees about another 60 million of revenue on top of that. So a real positive there as that's ramped up. Um, and the volumes and revenues in that contract are really, really robust. We don't expect to see any reduction in that going forward at all. And, and that will certainly do that 100 million plus per year that we were anticipating, if not, if not a, a tad more. And then finally, we come to the end of that graph and we see the um, upcoming opportunities. Um, there's a, a, a number of rebids still to go through. Um, we've made huge progress on retentions and rebids, which I'll come on to on the next slide. Over the course of the last 18 months or so, there's still a few opportunities to, to go out and to try and re-secure across the next six to 12 months in that area. And we've also got a bid pipeline of opportunities as well, where we'd be hopeful of picking up some of that work as well. In terms of the retention work, work on the basis we retain the vast majority of our contracts. Sometimes they change slightly, the, the, the size and scope of them change slightly, but our, our record of retention is outstanding. Again, as you'll see on the following slide. Um, and current and, and historically, our win rate on new business would typically be a, sort of a one in three. Having said that, you can see the 80% that I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's possible as we come out of COVID that, um, yeah, it's our time to some extent in terms of all those, uh, the upfront investment we've made in people, in IT, that we're really well placed to, to, to have a really good run and possibly beat that one in three uh, across the next 12, 24 months. So there's a really high level of detail on this slide. Um, yeah, an unusual level of detail. I think both ourselves and, and, and others as well would generally talk about contract A, contract B. Well, we've actually talked about the detail within our our, um, 
our forward order book in, in maintenance here um, and showed you some progress. So I think this is quite a useful slide to give you an indication of what our forward order book looks like. Um, and an important point for me is that there's there's a number of routes for us to maintaining existing relationships. So it's not just a case of a contract comes to an end. We rebid it. We either win or lose. There's a number of other options we have available to us. So again, off the back of long term, strong relationships to maintain uh, contracts without just going through that sort of uh, formal bid process. So some of the examples you can see there are a contract extension and, and you know, uh, the Cross Keys contract in Peterborough, uh, the East Kent housing contract. Uh, Lambeth, Milton Keynes, all opportunities to extend and we've we've negotiated and concluded on those with with customers and that knocks those contract completion dates back in some cases several years. So some real positives over the last 12 months in, in that respect. We have also got those contracts where they have come to an end, they have been retendered and we have won them and I'd like to think that our previous performance has a has some bearing on our ability to, to re-win those contracts. So a Rotherham Borough Council, Crawley Homes are, are good examples of that and, and Exeter City Council being the most recent. There's then also this opportunity to negotiate op uh, contracts. So I mentioned earlier those contracts where we have either made a decision not to um, re-tender so that, that slight change in our forward order book or customers have made a decision to go in a slightly different direction. Um, Brighton's a really good example of that. So we've worked with Brighton for a long time and a fantastic relationship there. Um, due to sort of political pressures, a decision was made to take that service back in house. But that wasn't the end of our relationship with Brighton. And in April this year, off the back of a negotiation, which lasts about 12 months, we've supported them to take their service back in-house and deliver it through a, through a direct council workforce. However we, however, we still have a huge part to play there. We provide infrastructure to the council. We manage all of their subcontractors, all their material procurement, their, their vans, their IT. Um, and we're on hand to deliver works for them where required as well. So, yeah, slight reduction in revenue, um, but potentially some opportunities to make similar if not better margins but probably more importantly um, slightly lower risk margins as well um, and North Lanarkshire is another example where there's been some negotiation there and I'll, I'll touch on that on the following slide so we've had some some really positive successes um, uh, a couple of wins um, in recent months but the two contracts I just want to briefly pick up on here are the MOD contract and the North Lanarkshire contract so the MOD contract is the inside the wire military bases across the country uh, managing and maintaining that property now, clearly we have expertise in both areas we can manage and we can maintain um, but the procurement process reached a point at which we had to make a decision it was one or the other and that was the client's desire so we decided to go with the management um, contract um, and we've been shortlisted down to the to the very last um, stage of that procurement process um, and it's a contract that has got fantastic strate strategic fit for us we already do the um, substitute accommodation outside the wire off the military um, bases and doing a really really good job of that with some ex an excellent client relationship so strategically in terms of our skill set um, in terms of that client it fits really really well and um, that procurement process will be concluded in H2. Um, yeah, and we're hopeful on that MOD opportunity. The other one to note there is the North Lanarkshire opportunity. So we've been delivering um, repairs and maintenance services to North Lanarkshire for a number of years. Um, and we negotiated an extension to that um, to that contract, uh, two and a half year extension uh, recently. Now they are going to go for a major re-procurement and the, um, that was anticipated to have kicked off around this time really. But again, because of COVID, um, and, and other reasons they felt it was prudent just to push that back a little bit so that will still come out and we're talking about a for uh, uh, 300 million per annum um, contract value um, 15 years in duration four and a half billion pound contract uh, and when that's procured um, we'll have the opportunity to we'll be really keen to, to bid that um, and should we be successful then our maintenance contract will just roll into that should we not be successful we'll continue to deliver our maintenance contract through to its its natural end so yeah the negotiation there has been a, a real positive for us but um yeah a, a huge opportunity and one that we'll we'll look forward to coming out probably at some point in 20 late 2021 and two other really good contract wins, as I say, in the last um, in, in recent weeks in with the Cornwall uh, contract which is absolutely um, sort of wraps in all of our key skill sets 
and is a really good example of what our, us as a group can deliver. And we're probably the the only show in town, really, in terms of that multifaceted contract that delivers management, maintenance, and care services. Um, and Exeter City Council, which is a, an atypical Mears maintenance contract. So I'll just conclude now with uh, with a short outlook. Um, so maintenance, the focus in H2 will be all around recovery, um, volumes coming back. Um, and we're, as I say, I've, I've talked through some numbers there. We're seeing volumes ramping up and we're, we're managing that restart, if you like, in a really diligent way, uh, working very closely with our customers about what restart plans look like, what the expectation is of, of clearing work over the coming months. And that's that's something that um, yeah is our bread and butter and is going very well so far, Touchwood. Um, we're anticipating bid, bidding activity starting to come back in late um, 2020 and certainly into 2021. Um, and we, we feel we're in a strong position to, to benefit from that. And we'll go into 2021 with a, um, a really high quality forward order book. In terms of management, um, a key focus uh, continues to be the asylum accommodation contract and continue to deliver very uh, strong operate operationally very strongly um, through what is clearly a challenging period with COVID, but also with increasing volumes. Those increasing volumes are a positive for us commercially, which is great, um, but important that we manage that operationally really well and, and, and continue to stay in, uh, uh, in line with the plan uh, and ensure that our 2021 numbers in, in on the asylum contract are where they need to be, because uh, that will um, that will be a material contribution to the overall group numbers. And secondly, in management, the MOD contract that I just mentioned, a strategically important contract for us, and, and that procurement will be concluded later this year. And finally, in, time, in terms of the wider group, um, we'll be working really hard in H2 to conclude um, on those areas that we've strategically made a decision to exit. Um, so Dom Care, really optimistic that will be concluded in the coming months and certainly in H2. Um, and development, that unwind, unwinding of funded development as well. Um, probably would be optimistic to think that will be 2020 now. That's more likely to be 2021 as we uh, wait for the effects of COVID to disappear. Um, but more importantly, we're very clear on where we're heading with that. And that will be unwound in a, in a um, controlled manner. Um, and we have one final part of our uh, uh, non-core um, uh, non uh, portfolio to, to uh, conclude on as well. So all of our non-core uh, business was a key part of that strategic route review 18 months ago and made clear decisions on domiciliary care, uh, on funded development. Uh, and the final part is a, a business within the group called TerraQuest, um, which runs a planning portal with central government a uh, fantastic piece of business, something that contributes uh, incredibly well to the group, but absolutely is non-core in terms of our our, how, our, um, our housing business and the, the management approach and the maintenance approach. So we've got some options around that as well, which we'll look to progress um, uh, through H2. Perfect. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet company platform. Um, and before we enter into the uh, Q&A, I'd like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. Immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and, and expectations. Um, Lucas, I, I know I haven't given you an awful lot of time to uh, review the uh, submitted questions today, um, but perhaps I could just hand over to you and ask you if you could read out the question and then perhaps give your uh, response where it's appropriate. If there are any, of course, that we can't address today, obviously, um, we've got the option to, to review those post the meeting as well. So if I may hand over back to you, that'd be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I'll just pick up on a, on a couple of questions submitted here. Um, so thanks very much for, for, for listening to the presentation and, and, um, and for submitting some questions as well. It's really, really useful. Uh, so the first question here, um, you mentioned typical contract length. Uh, how does that translate into visibility on revenues? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, absolute strength of the group really um revenue visibility so 
Uh, if you take a typical repairs and maintenance contract, you're looking at an average of about seven years in duration. So we don't really look at anything which is less than five years in duration. Um, in terms of how secure that revenue is, it's you know historically um, we deliver contracts well, um, so you can expect to run through to to the end of that contract uh, period. So yeah, that, like I say, a min on maintenance a minimum of five years, uh, tip typically an average of about seven years, and that gives that real um, security around our twenty one revenue, twenty two revenues. Um, and I would say certainly in terms of an investor case, that would be one of our absolute strengths: um, security of revenue. Um, historically, there may be some criticism that we're not the in some respects the most exciting of businesses but um through challenging periods i think um i think it's uh, that's one of our real strengths the um some of the longer contracts particularly in the management area so our more homes contract homelessness accommodation with london borough of bromley london borough of wolf and forest for example uh, they run up to 30 year terms so i, I wouldn't um suggest that they're they're the norm Hence, that average of about seven years for our contracts across the group. But we do have those really long term contracts as well. And if anything, the trend has been towards our average contract length increasing in recent years as a result of those types of contracts coming on stream. So, yeah, revenue visibility is, is, is excellent as a result of that. I'm just going to scroll down. There's a question here around dividend. Um, yeah, as you will have seen in the RS statement, we didn't think, feel it was appropriate to um, to pay a dividend at this time. Uh, I can only sort of reiterate um, the, the group's approach, really. We're, we're keen to return to a progressive dividend as, as soon as is possible. Um, but clearly, we'll have to see what H2 brings. Um, we're optimistic about H2, uh, but COVID is brings probably the, the greatest level of uncertainty we've ever ever had to deal with so yeah the, the board strategy is clear we want to we want to return to a, a progressive um, dividend approach to, to, to paying dividends as soon as possible okay i've got a question here about the um the win rate so first half win rate of 80 percent is great but do you see competition weakening in the current environment and providing an opportunity yeah, it does feel like there's a bit of a tailwind in terms of our uh, our ability to win work in maintenance and management. Um, competition itself, there's probably less players in the maintenance market now than there has been at any any time across the last, well, certainly my 16 years, the last the last 20 years, really. Um, it tends to be the same uh, same custom, uh, same businesses that we see tendering for each opportunity, um, and there are a number of the larger players, larger sort of more construction focused players who are no longer uh, looking at um, repairs and maintenance. And uh, yeah, uh, Kia would be an example of that. So um, yeah, potentially competition is weakening. Um, there will be other um, other players in the market. So some of those small meat and medium sized contractors picking up some of the smaller contracts with smaller local authorities and housing associations, but we haven't seen any of those break into that sort of top tier, um, the, the atypical Mears type contract repairs and maintenance contracts yet. So um, yeah, potentially opportunity there. And, and just one point to add to that as well, really, I mentioned the Cornwall District Council uh, contract that we've we've just secured and there's there's still some way to go to understand exactly what that may look like how big that may be over the coming years um, but we're we've been selected as their strategic partner and really we were the only as I said in, during the presentation the only show in town on those types of opportunity if a if a authority is looking for a single provider to to build not fund not fund so not funded development but build we still develop uh, we, it's the funding that we'll no longer be involved with so to look to develop, to um, manage, to maintain and provide care. So a large extra care scheme, for example. Yeah, we are the only single single provider who can deliver that service. So um, yeah, that's it. That's definitely a, uh, a huge opportunity in the coming years. Perfect. Okay, I think I think that does it, Mark. I think that does. Thank you very, very much indeed. I'm also mindful of time as we're coming up to to the hour. So I, I think um, obviously, if there are any questions that come in post this, obviously, as we said, they'll be available for for the company to review, um, and obviously, we'll publish these uh, responses where it's appropriate on the platform. Um, Lucas, perhaps just before I redirect investors to give feedback, if I could ask you just to wrap up, uh, and then obviously, um, I will then conclude the session. 
Great. Well, thanks very much for your time, everyone, this morning. Um, this is a platform that we haven't used before um, and I think we're keen to use going forward. So any feedback would be really appreciated. Um, typically, it's uh, interims around this time of the year in uh, in August. It's finals um, sort of third, fourth week of March. And we do look to do one or two capital market days through the course of the year as well. Really happy to take calls from individuals as well, both myself and um, Andrew and David, Chief Exec and Finance Director, uh, to talk more about our business. Um, and equally keen to do, um, we do quite a number of uh, visits to branches and, um, and days out to look at our operations as well. So, um, yeah, thanks for your time and uh, I look forward to the next one. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lucas, and thank you for updating investors today as part of your uh, roadshow. Um, could I ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, then the feedback page will appear. If you accessed it via the link sent to you by email, it will take a few moments, but you'll be asked to log back in and then submit your feedback. So on behalf of Mears Group um, Investor Meet Company, I'd like to thank you for attending today's session. Um, thank you very much and good day.